After the Second World War, air forces around the world knew the way forward was with turbine-powered aircraft. During the Korean War, Second World War piston fighters such as the F-51 and the LA-9 were quickly succeeded by jets such as the F-84 and MiG-9, in turn paving the way for the F-86 and MiG-15. Therefore, it was only a matter of time before supersonic fighters came to be in the pursuit for performance. With Britain having established a reputation for building great iconic aircraft since the First World War, it is obvious that they would keep that trend in the new age of supersonic jets. However, it would also mark the end of all British built fighters. This is the story of the English Electric Lightning. Before getting into the backstory of its creation, let's talk about its, well, quite unconventional design. I don't know why, but the British sure love designing some weird looking aircraft, such as the Fairy Gannet or the Nimrod AEW-3. But the Lightning was in a league of its own. Although its aesthetics are subject of debate, which I personally think it's beautiful but that was not always the case, there is no denying that it gave the awesome performance it had which is nicely summed up by this short extract from a very serious, totally related documentary. Now, I believe in speed. Power. Power and speed yes. solves many things. Yes. Right. James, how far? Middle of the puddle. Speed and power! Oh. Go faster! <laughs> yes, speed and power was everything. It was described by pilots to have rocket-like performance and could roll so fast even at Mach 2 that the limiting factor was the pilot himself. To figure out how English Electric pulled off such a feat, let's first look at the engine placement. The very first of many quirks and features this plane has is that its two engines are stacked one on top of the other. So why do such a thing? BECAUSE SPEED AND POWER This arrangement allowed the Lightning to be powered by two Rolls-Royce Avon engines, while also reducing frontal drag by as much as 25% compared to a twin-engine layout of more conventional design, such as that on the F4 Phantom II. But this design feature provided the Lightning more advantages that other twin-engine aircraft did not have. For example, Having both engines one on top of the other meant they provided thrust on the centerline axis of the aircraft, immunizing it from asymmetrical thrust if an engine were to fail. This also meant that cruising with only one engine was possible, effectively increasing efficiency and thus allowed for increased range or endurance. However, this was rarely done as the risk of losing the remaining engine would result in a complete loss of hydraulic power. Additionally, due to both engines being so close to each other, should one of them suffer an uncontained failure, damage to the other engine was likely to happen. Nevertheless, such an arrangement meant that the Lightning could reach speeds of Mach 1.7 on early variants, and on later variants could reach the Mach 2.0 barrier. Now let's move on to the next most striking feature of the Lightning, its wings. The Lightning's wings are sharply slapped back at 60 degrees, with the wingtip edges angled perpendicularly to the fuselage, giving a profile similar to that of a delta wing, but with the inner rear corners cut out. The unconventional profile of the wings meant the control surfaces were oddly placed. The ailerons, for example, were placed at the perpendicular edge of the wing, meaning they were virtually straight into the relative wind flowing over the wing. On the other hand, the flaps were, are placed on the inside of the wings, meaning they are also incredibly swept. As a result of all these, the Lightning had wings that could be regarded as hybrids between delta wings and swept wings, giving it the advantages of a delta wing in supersonic flight without compromising on low-speed handling, as proven by the short SB-5. It was demonstrated that the Lightning had superb flight characteristics, and was recognized and classified as a fully aerobatic aircraft. A noteworthy comment on the Lightning is its roll rate, which was so incredible that most pilots could not even tolerate it. The Lightning, much like most aircraft, was not immune to operational handicaps. Its biggest disappointment was its range, or more accurately, lack thereof. From the beginning, the Lightning was a design that provided the qualities sought in an interceptor. 
with a climb rate of 20,000 feet per minute, pilots described it as being saddled to a rocket. But such thrill from flying this aircraft could only be achieved for short periods of time. Despite its great performance and speed and maneuverability, it had to compromise on its range capability, a setback which would never completely be solved. The first production variant, the F-1, had a range radius of only 150 miles from its base. For perspective, the distance between Calgary and Edmonton is 175 miles. However, it was the F-3 variant which, with its better performing but thirstier engines, that had the shortest range. This was mitigated with fuel tanks on top of the wings, complemented by previously used air-to-air -air refueling probes on previous F-1A aircraft. The last variant, the F-6, had a larger barely tank, which virtually doubled the fuel capacity compared to smaller tanks of the previous versions, whilst retaining the ability to have fuel tanks on its overwing hardpoints. Therefore, it had the longest range. In short, the Lightning was a twin-engine aircraft with the fuel capacity of a single-engine aircraft. Here's what Major Bill Beardsley of the United States Army Air Force had to say on the Lightning. Yes, short legs, but a great turning radius and excellent acceleration. The Lightning's roots lie all the way back to 1947, when the Ministry of Supply awarded a contract to English Electric to build an aircraft that could reach Mach 1.5. Progress led to the P-1 prototypes designed as supersonic research aircraft. Its distinctive features such as the engine placement and extremely swept wings made for an aggressive design, more so than contemporary fighters such as the MiG-19 or even the F-100 Super Sabre. However, the Royal Aeronautical Establishment was skeptical of English Electric's claims of performance, so much so that they persuaded the Air Ministry to contract the Short Brothers and Hartland Limited Company to build a short SB-5 to explore the low-speed flying characteristics of the P-1, much to the displeasure of English Electric. Despite trying to prove that a T-tail configuration would work better than English Electric's low mountain tailplane, and also testing the low-speed handling of the extremely swept wings, when the SP-5 was modified to support the low-mounted tailplane of the English Electric design configuration, it actually demonstrated to be a better concept, validating the designer of the Lightning, William Edward Willoughby Teddy Peter, who never seriously considered a T-tail. By the way, Teddy also designed the extremely popular Canberra Bomber, and later on the fallen to Gnat, also known as the Oscar EW5894 Phallus Tactical Fighter Bomber. Its lightweight swept wing design makes it extremely maneuverable and agile. Beneath its skin of 21st century composites is a highly advanced avionics and weapons package. Designed for speed and combat acrobatics, it features the latest Mrs. Halvers series 3800 radar jamming for Amos. The first P-1 prototype took off for the first time in August 1954 at the controls of English Electric's test pilot, Roland Beamond. On its third flight, it exceeded Mach 1, being the first British aircraft to do so while at supercruise no less. Supercruise is a term created during the American Advanced Tactical Fighter Program, describing supersonic flight without the use of afterburner. The second P-1 prototype, the P-1A, flew in July 1955, however, the P-1s differed considerably from what would be the production aircraft, lacking any armament, radar, or belly tanks, along with different engines and other differences. By then, work on the possible production variant, the P-1B, had begun. This prototype had little resemblance from the previous P-1 aircraft, so much so that concern about its cancellation from the government arose. By choosing to name their new aircraft P-1B as if being a mere variant of the previous prototypes, English Electric has most likely saved the program unlike many other advanced fighter programs that succumbed to the 1957 Defense White Paper. The P-1B first flew in April 1957, and on that very flight exceeded Mach 1 in Super Cruise, and in July of that year would break the world airspeed record set at Mach 1.72. Although the original specifications only required a top speed of Mach 1.5, English Electric saw that it could make its aircraft reach Mach 2 and be superior in flight characteristics at that speed than the American F-104 Starfighter also capable of Mach 2. 